Antimicrobials are some of the most important drugs used in veterinary and human medicine. And as future prescribers, it's really important that you understand their mechanisms of action and spectrum of activity. In today's lecture, we're going to be going over a summary of the antimicrobials that are currently available. Now, this is a really big topic and one that I know a lot of students struggle with. And so I'm going to put a link above to a list of explainer videos where I go through both the antimicrobial classes that we're talking about today, as well as some other minor classes in detail. You can use this to help you study. Any discussion of antimicrobials, I think, necessarily starts in the pre-antibiotic era. It's hard to appreciate just how important these drugs are if we don't consider what life was like before we actually had them. So the widespread use of these drugs was not really possible until the 1940s. And before we had these tools, we were essentially powerless to stop invasive infections. If you go into um, some historical accounts from the literature, there's some really horrifying stories from conflict settings, things like World War I, um, where soldiers would become wounded, they would develop an infection, which would progress to sepsis and death. Similarly, tuberculosis was rampant in urban areas, sexually transmitted infections were essentially untreatable and were essentially considered moral problems rather than medical problems that we could deal with using medicines. Um, in World War I, uh, there were reports of high rates of venereal disease in U.S. Uh, Army soldiers, up to about 27%. So infectious disease was really a non-trivial matter uh, before the antimicrobial era. Before we had modern antibiotics, we had to resort to some pretty um, grisly uh, therapeutic options. So this is a photo that I took at the State Library of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, of some mercury compounds that were used for treating venereal diseases. And so those people who had gonorrhea would have this injected uh, using a rubber catheter directly into a urethra. And if you had syphilis, this mercury was injected directly into the patient's bloodstream. So certainly something that we want to avoid going back to as we see the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. Of course, the antimicrobial era started uh, with Alexander Fleming making his very famous observation in the late 1920s. Um, this is a picture of Fleming in his lab. And here you can see um, an excerpt from his paper where he said it was noticed that around a large colony of contaminating mold, the Staphylococcus colonies became transparent and were obviously undergoing lysis. This was an observation that he didn't simply discount, but looked into further. Um, here's one of those original pictures of his uh, uh, plates with this penicillium mold, and you can see these very tiny lysing staph colonies surrounding it. In this cartoon here, what we can see is actually some of the early recognition of intrinsic antimicrobial resistance. So penicillin included in the agar plate was able to inhibit staph, streps, pneumococcus, gonococcus, and what later became carinibacterium, uh, but not uh, E. coli or other gram-negative rods. The field of anti-infective biology has a number of Nobel Prizes within it, including, of course, uh, Alexander Fleming, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1945, along with Ernst Chain and Howard Florey for the discovery and commercialization of penicillin. Prior to the clinical introduction of penicillin, sulfonamide-type drugs were used for treating streptococcus infections. And although protonsil was discovered after penicillin, um, it was made commercially available first. And then finally, in 1952, we had the discovery of streptomycin, the first antibiotic active against tuberculosis. As I'm sure you can imagine, this was an era of great excitement in infectious diseases and microbiology. And we term this period from the mid-40s to the mid-60s, the golden age of antimicrobial drug discovery, where many of our compounds that are still used today, or at least those drug families, were initially uh, discovered. 
Following the golden era, we sort of moved into this slower period where relatively few new drug compounds were discovered. And unfortunately, we had the emergence of resistance to older pre-existing compounds during this time frame. More recently, we've seen more new drugs developed against gram-positive bacteria, particularly targeting MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, VRE, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, and Clostridioides difficile. We aren't yet caught up with the emergence of resistance, and so our antimicrobial chemotherapeutic options are still lagging the emergence of resistance uh, in clinically important bacteria. I find going back to the literature from the early days of antimicrobial resistance really useful in trying to understand where we are now. In this quote here from Dr. Mary Barber and John Burston from a 1955 paper, they state that it's a neck and neck race in which many of us tend to underestimate the opponent, staphylococci, which will not be defeated by the haphazard use of each new antibiotic. As new antibacterial agents are discovered, let us use them with discrimination. I think this is a really powerful and insightful comment, and although it was written in 1955, it's just as relevant today. I've put a link to a video above where you can see just how rapidly bacteria are able to develop resistance or at least tolerance to antimicrobials under sustained selection pressure. So how do antibiotics actually work? Well, a uniting feature of all of these drugs is that they attack physiological processes that are unique to bacteria. So targeting uh, anatomical structures or metabolic uh, processes that eukaryotes um, do in a different way. Whether it's that peptidoglycan cell wall, the outer membrane, the machinery required for nucleic acid synthesis, metabolism and organization, or protein synthesis, and the distinct bacterial ribosome. These are all valuable targets that have been exploited as mechanisms of action of antimicrobials. Bacteria can resist antibiotics using a similarly broad spectrum of strategies. So whether it's decreased permeability, so to prevent entry of the drug, active efflux, pumping it out before it's able to attach to its target, enzymatic degradation or alteration to destroy or otherwise inactivate the antimicrobial, to modify their targets, to sort of put on a mask and disguise so that the drug doesn't recognize where it's supposed to bind to, to use alternate metabolic pathways. So achieve the same physiological endpoint by an alternate process that is independent of the uh, target that the drugs attack, or simple resistance by absence, so lacking the target that drugs have. All of these strategies can be responsible for resistance either intrinsically or after organisms gain genetic competence, so acquired resistance. Briefly want to just summarize a few key definitions again. We talked about the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, in a previous lecture, but just to reiterate, this is the minimum concentration that will inhibit an organism's growth, so not necessarily kill the organism. And by convention, MICs are reported on this log 2 scale, so 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 12, etc., micrograms per milliliter. The minimum bactericidal concentration, or MBC, is the minimum drug concentration that will actually kill the organism. So not just arrest its growth, but actually kill it. Understanding these two uh, metrics is really important for how we classify drugs. So we refer, refer to an antimicrobial as bacteriostatic when its minimum bactericidal concentration is greater than four times the MIC. So it takes a lot more drug to kill the organism than it does to just inhibit it. While a bactericidal antimicrobial is when the minimum bactericidal concentration is less than four times the MIC. So we can inhibit it with a quantity of drug, and then just a little bit more is required in order to kill it. Tetracyclines are a classic example of a bacteriostatic family of drugs, while our penicillins or other beta-lactams are sort of the archetypal bactericidal compounds. I briefly want to mention one other pharmacodynamic uh, consideration that I think is really important for future prescribers to understand. 
And that is whether a drug can be classified as being either concentration dependent or time dependent. Concentration dependent antimicrobials have activity which relies on exceeding the MIC as much as possible at the site of infection. And it's less important what proportion of the day they exceed that MIC. So as a consequence, when we're dosing these drugs, things like the fluoroquinolones or aminoglycosides, we may be able to give our patients one or two big doses a day, as opposed to multiple small doses per day. Time-dependent drugs have activity which rely on how long we're able to maintain drug concentrations exceeding the MIC. So what percentage of the day are these concentrations uh, maintained? And for these compounds, things like the beta-lactams or penicillins, we require multiple doses per day. I'm not going to be going into these pharmacologic metrics anymore during this lecture, so consider this just a primer for future pharmacology courses. The first class of drugs that we're going to be discussing are the beta-lactams. These are cell wall synthesis inhibitors that bind to the very aptly named penicillin binding proteins in the cell wall. These are transpeptidases and carboxypeptidases, which are involved in peptidoglycan cross-linking. And so by inhibiting these enzymes, we prevent the final stage of peptidoglycan synthesis and disrupt the bacterial cell wall. The beta-lactams are a superfamily of antimicrobials, including the penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, as well as our beta-lactamase inhibitors. And these drugs are all united by this common structure. So what you can see circled in red here is our four-membered beta-lactam ring. This is the common structure. And it's proved to be a very useful scaffolding on which this whole superfamily of drugs has been built. But as you'll learn later in this class, it's also proven to be a vulnerability. Because we have this common structure, it's a common target for bacterial degradative enzymes that are able to break down these drugs, leading to resistance. We're going to start by going through the penicillins and discussing their spectrum of activity. So first we have uh, those drugs that are classified as penicillinase stable penicillins. So these are compounds which are primarily active against staphylococci and would include uh, cloxacillin and flucloxacillin, as well as the more historical oxacillin and methicillin. These drugs don't have any coverage against gram-negatives, anaerobes, or enterococci. Next are sort of our original recipe penicillin. So penicillin G, this is Alexander Fleming penicillin, penicillin V, and procaine penicillin. They're active against, again, gram-positive cocci, this time including streps and enterococci, and wimpy anaerobes, whether they're gram-positive or gram-negative. We have our amino penicillins, amoxicillin and ampicillin, which have greatly improved spectrum compared to our original penicillin. So particularly against gram negatives, commonly encountered pathogens like E. coli, um, unless they have acquired resistance, are susceptible to amoxicillin and ampicillin. And then finally, we have our anti-pseudomonal penicillins like piperacillin greatly enhanced gram-negative spectrum, including most of our enterobacteriales and susceptible Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations are very, very important and very commonly used in clinical practice. Currently available products that might be used in veterinary medicine include clavulanic acid with amoxicillin, sulbactam with ampicillin as an IV-only preparation, and potentially used in some settings, piperacillin with tazobactam. These types of beta-lactamase inhibitors act by irreversibly binding to the serine catalytic site. Not all beta-lactamases can be inhibited, but our narrow-spectrum class A enzymes, which are very common among enterobacteriales, readily inhibited uh, with these compounds. Next, we have our cephalosporins, which are commonly grouped into generations. So our first-generation cephalosporins, cefazolin, cephalexin, and cefadroxyl. We primarily think of these as having activity against gram-positives, great against staphs and streps. They do have moderate activity against 
uh, some wimpy gram negatives, so those without beta lactamases, things like E. coli. Our second generation cephalosporins have improved gram negative activity and somewhat less gram positive activity. And the same holds true for our third generation cephalosporins. Again, enhanced gram negative activity and weakened gram positive activity. There are some third generation cephalosporins which do retain excellent activity against gram positives. Um, an example would include cefovacin, which is a third generation used in companion animal practice, which is still quite effective against uh, Staphylococcus pseudintermedius. As a practitioner, what you need to be aware of is what is your target pathogen and does the third generation cephalosporin you're considering using actually have activity against it? And then we have our fourth generation cephalosporins like cefepime, which is highly active against gram negatives and retains some activity against gram positives. Generally speaking, the way that I think about these drugs is that we move up in generation from first to fourth, we get improved activity against gram negatives, increasing resilience against bacterial beta lactamases, so those degradative enzymes that break down these compounds and less activity against gram positives. Finally, we have our cefamycins. Um, these are sometimes grouped in with our second generation cephalosporins, but they are in fact distinct from them, both in terms of their spectrum of activity and the mechanisms by which bacteria develop uh, cefamycin resistance. So cefoxetin and cefotetin have good activity against both gram positives and negatives, but excellent activity against anaerobes. And so for this reason, you may see them used in treating abdominal infections in cases where we have ruptured bowels. We have a variety of other beta-lactam drugs that I think are infrequently used in veterinary medicine. Um, first are our carbapenems. These are very broad spectrum. They're able to inhibit the growth of most gram positives, negatives, and anaerobes. Um, and these are really last line of defense drugs um, for treating infections in people. So as future veterinarians, um, this is something that I want you to resist the temptation to use. These are critically important for when we end up in the hospitals ourselves, and we don't want to be applying a selection pressure for resistance in our veterinary species. That does not constitute uh, prudent use of these antibiotics. And then our final class are the monobactams, of which astrionum is our primary example. Astrionum has no activity against gram-positive bacteria, and it's really probably best known for its anti-pseudomonal activity. Mm -hmm.